coding on there. Congratulations, James Glancy. What am I congratulating for? I don't know. You tell me. It's not the MEP bollocks. It's uh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, so as to go on. It's uh, second, uh, the first ever second appearance on the HR podcast. I thought it would be that. So I was the fiftieth. Right in front of that. I was the fiftieth. You were the fiftieth, and you're the first to. Uh, you, know, you can move it about when you you waffling. I was uh, I was joking about the MEP sentiment. Absolutely, congratulations, mate. Thank you. However, I am more pleased to be back here with you speaking so what number is this what number what podcast are we on 55 okay 55 i was only five yeah. okay but don't ch- i let's i want to get back on to the mep stuff yeah yeah so Wait, let me what happened so, i don't understand no not most people don't and in some ways that's including myself but what happened uh, since i last left you i've been working on my conservation projects with veterans for wildlife um we've been working on pitches for new conservation adventurous wildlife tv shows and that still goes on but i um, got asked to go to a party on the 29th of march which is when britain was supposed to leave the european union as was um mandated by parliament and what theresa may said was going to happen and i got asked to go to a party um, basically a group of people had um put down Sorry. Could, do you want to sort your phone out? No, Sorry. <laughs> Basically, a group of, a group of um, people from this organisation called Leaves Mean Leave who were passionate about leaving the European Union put down a deposit to have a party on the 29th of March because they thought it would be some sort of Freedom Day and that, obviously that didn't happen. I got asked to go um, because I knew somebody that was going and they wanted to make up some numbers to make sure the booze got drunk. So I went along. Free booze. And... <laughs> I then got said, asked, would I be interested in running in the Euro elections <laughs> on the 29th of March? And I thought, you know, I have supported Brexit because of sovereignty. I believe this country should be uh, a sovereign nation. We must work with other countries and we can come back to that later on. Um, and I also felt that, you know, a lot of people that have voted leave have been um, labelled as extremists and fascists and racists and all sorts of things, which aren't true and i thought you know what i'm going to stand up and say you know if you vote for something it should be followed through that's what i've always believed in i believe in democracy the rule of law so you know i will make a stand and they said yeah they're launching this party and they're going to stand in the euro elections if they happen it wasn't clear they were going to happen so i said yeah fine and then i um they sent me an application form i signed that and then they said would you mind being announced as a candidate so what did you sign? What did you sign? Sorry, what was it? Well, they they gave you they give you this candidate application form, which is to be vetted. This on the night were you pissed? No, well, the first night when I had I had been drinking, I said, "Yeah, it sounds like fun." Then afterwards, I considered it. I spoke to a few people, and they said, "You know, why don't you run? It, it may not happen. We didn't think it was going to happen." I then went for some some meetings and interviews, and it was very much a single issue party, which is to um, campaign to respect the result of the referendum. So all based on democracy. Very simple, no manifesto. I said, well, you know, it's not difficult to uh, run for. And there was no election. No one, it wasn't confirmed as happening. So I became a candidate. And then Theresa May announced that we are actually um, going to run in the uh, European elections because um, she couldn't take us out on the 29th of March. And I then got asked to be announced as a candidate um, by the Brexit party as it as it became known with the full branding and everything launched and yeah that that just changed my life considerably over the last six weeks because when I got rolled out as a candidate um it, the, the Daily Mail put me as the number one article that afternoon noon the Daily Mail online which is the most widely oh, read really? yeah paper or in the online newspaper so within um well, within one day, um, I was then suddenly being asked to do loads of media, social media, my own personal social media went crazy. And then I was thrown into this political world. What did you expect, though? When in, Did you not expect to be thrown into the political world? Yeah, no, no, because I've, I've <laughs> always had an interest in politics. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. I've always had an interest and I've always thought I'll go into politics at some point. But... Um, Look, if you look at previous Euro elections, nobody has taken any notice. Certainly, wouldn't have made anywhere near the top ten news articles on the Daily Mail 
certainly not front pages. It was mu- it was it would be more like a glorified council election. But because of the issue of Brexit, how divisive it has been, there's so many things that's thrown up. It was the number one political piece of news, if not the political piece of news of new parties refighting the referendum. So every candidate was thrown into this prominence. And then when we realised the Conservative Party weren't going to run a campaign, Labour has self-destructed, it then became a two-horse race between the Liberal Democrats and the Brexit Party, which gained all this momentum from doing these rallies. Obviously, Nigel Nigel Farage is one of the most um, capable campaigners in British history. He knows how to run a campaign, knows how to set up a party. So we had this momentum and this press attention they were getting some other big characters that, that joined as candidates. Five, five, six weeks later, I'm stood there elected as an MEP. So um, I'm. this is one week on, by the way, and um, I've had time to think about things. And, you know, it, it's been broadly very, very positive. I thought I would get um, hounded by people, and there's been some negativity. But people are really positive about, um, one, the party, Two, making a stand for something I believe in, and uh, three, the potential opportunities it could throw up. So, well, the thing is, <coughs> so I uh, I agree with like the, the labels that go have gone to people who are within the Brexit party or Brexiteers, but it goes both ways. It goes, yeah, it does. Know, yeah, the, the people who are on the Remainers side get yeah. labelled and whatever. Um, and when and I, I when when I saw you, I can't remember who told me you you I didn't even know you were a candidate. Um, I can't remember who told me who elected. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? One, what the bloody hell is he doing? And uh, and two, oh my god, he's in for a storm of negativity online. But then uh, when you were talking, then it's it made me realise you, it's it must be very difficult for people who are that who are that that sort of right, left, blue, red, uh, progressive, or flipping Nazi. You know, they they box people into different mm. different boxes. It's very difficult for them to come and have a go at you because of like your conservation work. You know, you're not you, you're not you you're not the stereotypical person they would assume to be part of the Brexit party, which gets labelled as fl- racist and all sorts. It's just it's just madness. It's madness. Uh, um, no, no, no. I think and it's nice to hear that you haven't had much neg- negativity. That surprises me as well, though. There has been some, but um. I think my view on it, when I realised how serious it was going to become in that first couple of weeks, um, I obviously thought, what have I done? But at the same time, I thought, you know, if you come across, just be honest about your motivations and what you believe in, then a majority of people are reasonable and are decent and they see you for who you are. Whatever party you stand in, we know the Labour Party has decent people and has some absolute lunatics. We know that's the same in the Conservative Party. Every political party has people we respect and others we disagree with and others we just think we just you'd never want to meet them or anyone ever want to associate with them. That that is the same with what's happened in the Brexit Party. So, you know, yeah, my concentration is environmental and green issues. And the people that have been most vocal at having a go at me have been environmentalists. Really? Hmm. Because they see it as a bad thing that you're associating with the Brexit Party Brexit Party. So what the view is is that um Broadly, conservation of the environment is the um, baby of the left. It's they believe that they've championed it and you can't really be sort of right or centre or a Brexiteer and be interested in the environment, which is wrong because the first prominent figure in British politics to talk about the climate crisis, global warming, was Margaret Thatcher. Oh. Yeah, and, and she made a very bold speech about climate change but the thing is if you look at people like donald trump you look at the republican right and there is an international corporate movement of climate change deniers people that are not interested in wildlife they would happily dig up the entire world for its natural resources for its oil regardless of what destruction they cause to ecosystems Um, they are a prominent wealthy group of people and they have backed populist movements around the world and there are people, some people in the Brexit party have expressed um, skepticism towards climate issues. There are plenty of conservationist environmental people in it, as there are in the Labour Party and the Conservative Party um, across the political spectrum. But it was assumed that this new party would be anti-environment. It hasn't actually even got a manifesto or policies about the environment yet. They will be green. 
I doubt they'll be as green as the greens, but um, there there will be a good environmental policy. But it's just not the case that just because you support Brexit doesn't make you um, somebody that absolutely passionately cares about the environment. And if you look to me, two people I have respect for who are campaigners for nature, Ben Goldsmith, Zach Goldsmith, their father founded the referendum party in the early 90s, the party that wanted a referendum on <coughs> membership of the European Union. And they are prominent environmentalists and campaigners for animal welfare. And they're the people that inspired me. Is that referendum party, um, my old school school teacher actually stood for them. So he's probably potentially one of the people that influenced my <laughs> view on um, the European Union. I saw and I still see the Brexit party in its early stages very much um, a referendum party and not a UKIP. I would never have stood for UKIP or been involved in that organisation. What's, what's so the aim of the aim of the Brexit party is basically to deliver Brexit, right? To put pressure on the main parties at Westminster to deliver Brexit. And then what happens after that? Well, exactly. Um, it, this is a, an interesting phase because um, the leader Nigel Farage has said, said he wants to fight a general election and he'll sit select. There's 650 M uh, MPs or candidates you need to put forward to fight a general election. Huge thing. And he's saying he wants to fight the general election, which would mean fighting against Conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrats, Greens. Uh, huge prospects, but it obviously um, could potentially mean splitting uh, the right to centre vote. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of issues that need to be talked about there. And that <coughs> obviously means having a full manifesto on everything that affects our lives, or at least a policy positions. Uh, they don't want to use the word manifesto so there's a lot there's a lot to play for but i have said um i'm happy and i feel like i've done the right thing standing up on an issue i believe in, which is democracy respecting the result of the referendum um, and i will take my duties as an mep come the first of july seriously but um i'm not looking to go full-time um straight into politics which would mean fighting a general election as well um, i'm going to do i've done my bit and um depending on how last, long this lasts we should be out on the 31st of october but we may not but beyond that you know i want to get back to my conservation environmental work um and some and, and some of that through making tv shows but uh, god knows how this is going to long last this is mm. going to long uh, last for mm. a lot of it's i mean a lot of a lot of it's riding on uh the decisions that labor and conservatives make now I, I feel like if they were to you know the, the Brexit parties and the Lib Dems, like you said, they've been prospered off those two clusters going on at the minute. You're absolutely right, yeah. Um, which isn't such a bad thing. Good to shake up the nest sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I, I am, I'm in line with your view that um, the, the people vote was the, the people vote for something. There was a vote, and the vote was in favour of Y as opposed to X. So Y should be delivered. That's what I think, regardless of what the, regardless yeah. of what the, the, that that vote was on. Um, but I do think that if uh, I can't see the Conservatives getting their acting gear um, enough to get a lot of public opinion back inside, the public support back inside. But I think with Labour, if Corbyn goes and they get someone else in, I, I do think that it'll, it'll go. The public, the public opinion will come back in favour of Labour and sort of the, the likes of the Brexit Party and Lib Dems. That that wave that's been ridden now would quite easily go away. But again, I can't see that happening either. Corbyn would have gone by now. He's a madman. I mean, you, you would think he's gone by now. He's just no, seems no. to be doing more harm than good in, his, in that party. But he cemented his position through momentum, uh, and because they did quite well in the last general election, so he's still strong. But I mean, what is going on? That a new party can establish itself for six weeks and win an election—that's extraordinary. Uh, the Lib Dems, who are all but wiped out, down to I think eleven or twelve MPs in the last general election, they're back. They've got the bit between their teeth we've seen a green surge across europe lots of green parties are doing well and uh the tories have just hit under uh, may have hit the self-destruct button and now we've got this leadership campaign which is completely ludicrous 12 people think that they should be prime minister i mean you've got to be joking most of them shouldn't be allowed to be in politics i mean there is we are bereft of talent you just and, and that you know when you speak to people that stood for the brexit party um a lot of them said, you know, you know what? I looked at who's in politics now and thought, could I do a better job than them? And they're successful people, hardworking people from a variety of backgrounds. 
And they, they asked themselves that question. And they're like, yeah, I could actually. So when they got this opportunity to, to um, sign up as a candidate, people said, yeah, I'll give it a go. <clears throat> and because it, the party has so little time to make a decision on um, candidates, it's given ordinary people, people from business, people that have worked in, um, in banks, in the NHS, in the armed forces, uh, as cabin crew, from a huge variety of backgrounds, the opportunity to have a voice. And by pure chance, you know, we, we are going to increase the diversity, the ethnic diversity of the European Union. We're almost going to double it. The Brexit party. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, this, the European Union is all um, almost 100. It's like 98% white people, mainly white men that run it. The European Commission, European Parliament, the European judges. And so we've got... Um, candidates a diverse range of candidates of who are now ME, are now elected MEPs for example we've got the first person in Scotland um first black person to be elected for um for a parliamentary position openly gay guy yeah I didn't know that so we've got you know, it's extraordinary what's happened is having a new party with a um a different selection system is giving people from all walks of life the ability to access politics and the reason they're doing that is People are either disconnected and think, I don't want anything to do with it, or they're so raging, raging listening to um, LBC or listening to the news, they think, oh, I want to do something. And, when, and I've thought that for a long time. And I thought, you know, when the opportunity came, I was like, okay, it's a quick snap decision. Let's see what happens. So we're on the horse. It's good, mate. I'm excited. I'm excited <laughs> for you. <it. laughs> I'm glad I'm not you, though. <laughs> uh, what, um, what's the... So come first of July. Come first of July. What's the uh, what? You, got any idea what your work routine's going to be like? What you got, what your commitments yeah, yeah, are? No, the, yeah, I do. You? I I do have some idea. I don't know how consuming it's going to be, um, from a personal point of view or professional point of view. But next week we're going over for the inductions. Like first day at school, or, you know, well, like joining the military. You've got Safety to take, brief and that. You, yeah, exactly. You've got to take your ID. <laughs> you've got to take your bank account stuff and just show you, prove you, all that. Stuff I imagine will be shown around. I, I, I can only imagine there'll be a dull as hell health and safety brief. I'll make sure I'm outside going for a run when we have that one. But that sort of joining run. And then, um, well, we do have a joining run, actually. There's, there's these sort of parties that happen, political parties. I bet that's fun, isn't it? <laughs> this meeting of the other enemy. It's going to be a real experience. So we've got the, we've, we've got the, the admin and then there's some drinks and things like that. But then I think things officially kick off um, on the 1st, 2nd of July. Parliament sits. And we also have had to submit applications for what committees we want to sit on. What are we... There's loads of committees, isn't there? When I, cause when I heard about you, I went and actually did some research yeah. on Europe. You know, what, what's all this jazz? Man, it's committees for committees. But it's, they're, um, they're... Me too. I, I've had... <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. yeah, there's loads of green ones. I know it's brilliant. I've, so I've, yeah, yeah that's why I've put myself forward for the environmental committee and the defence committee because I happen to know a little bit about those and I care about those two issues, um, and I think that's going to be fascinating. Mm. And you know, it's not all bad in the EU. There is there is opportunity to do some good. I still believe we should leave and be independent, but um, got to take a constructive approach to um, anything that you do when you're representing your country. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, whether we're in the EU or the or they're out the way we do things now still affects us Absolutely, <laughs> in the yeah. future you know what yeah, I mean yeah, yeah. it's just it's gonna happen um yeah it is exciting mate it is exciting this is the first interview personally I've given since I've been an M MEP so is it yeah, and yeah. I was swearing at the start well it's fine oh that's right okay this I mean I imagine some people like journalists and stuff will sort of trawl through this to see if I've made any Oh, yeah. huge errors but i can only i can only approach it and be honest about the experience so far um i've enjoyed it and i'm i'm actually looking forward to it um but the question i, I did radio for actually the other day was a very good snapshot they said what happens if we don't leave on the 31st of october and i said oh, well, we will cross that bridge when we get there because um say we do not end up for some reason leaving the european union you're elected for five years oh ah. yeah What's that? Twenty twenty four. I don't know how old I'll be old. How old I'll be then? But You'd be like fifty four, fifty five. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, mate. Yeah, I mean, so you know, things 
these are all things to consider. I, I described it as this. Imagine I said, Keir, do you want to go for a 5K run? You're like, all right, fine. I can crack that. Whilst we're running, I'm like, do you know what, mate? I'm, I lied. It's a marathon. <laughs> And then when we get to 26.1 miles, I was like, oh, fuck it. Let's just crack an iron man whilst we're at it. Yeah. And that's, you know, but this is potentially what we're facing. It's meant to be 31st of October cut off. It could be next year or it could be it's five years. Can you see, uh, can you see as not leaving? Yeah, I think. I think really? Yeah, well, I think it's less likely now. Well, put it this way. If, if we had a second referendum i think would be rather uh, we're evenly split fairly evenly split could be the other way around could be the same could be 50 50 i'm not sure that's going to answer any questions it's just going to push um parties further entrenched into their positions create an even bigger backlash my view is that we've got to give this a go we've got to, the, the country is going to succeed in or out the european union we're great britain it's just the model that we follow. And I have said this, I said this to on a CNN interview, that democracy is not a static process. The future of the country uh, evolves. And we've got to give this a good go for a solid period of time. You know, two to three parliaments at the minimum, which is over 15 years. And at that point, you can reflect and say, if the European Union is just a roaring success and it's running away and we've been left behind, then it's quite right for that generation to be able to have a vote to go back in and renegotiate terms. But if Britain is successful and the European Union is just doing its thing as it is now, it's either crumbled or it isn't successful, um, yeah, people still have the right to review that. Um, but if, if, it, if we are successful, we're unlikely to go back in. I think fundamentally um, by us leaving the european union um, by paying you know they've got a smaller budget we're a net contributor so for, for every pound we give we get less money back so we we bankroll the, the institution they will struggle without us without our um, gravitas on the world stage and, and you know it may it may well falter but who knows i, d I don't think anybody I, you'd be a, a very um strong character or you know to put money on what's going to happen in the united kingdom or the european union over the next five years the, the, the question the question for me with it with it all now is not um what what's better uh sorry what's gonna what's gonna be what's better stay in or, or stay in the eu or, or leave um <clears throat> that that that's the question that was being asked before you know before the vote the question now is well, for me, the, the the factor is no, not about whether we're going to be good or not being out of the EU if we if we leave. It's that that like we were saying just now, there's been a vote, and it's not being delivered. You know, like regardless of what, what the outcome is, like as I just alluded to, and it, the prospect of the prospect of us not leaving, and let's say a, 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 well, it'd have to be through a second referendum, wouldn't it? A, a second referendum being called, and and let's say a vote happened and it goes the other way. Prospect of that happening frightens me, because, um, because I think that the Brexiteers, they we would see r rioting, a lot of rioting, it's, it's a lot of violence. <coughs> I just think it would happen just because of the. I, ju I just I just think that's what I want to go mm. towards. But also, on the long term, and sort of an, on a more psychological, so sociological kind of point of view. In future votes or whatever they are, be it for a general election or be it for a local council or be it to um, maybe vote to go, go back in the EU, for example. Oh no, well, it'd be to leave the EU a second time. Um, how could you have any faith in any of that? How could you? It's it, it it it's and and the argument that the argument really annoys me. Um, to say that well, we should have a second referendum, referendum because. Uh, what they said was lies, and it's it's different now, and we know so much more now. No, 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 no. Everyone is still speculating. Everyone is still speculating. Maybe little things like the uh, the allegation that um, Boris Johnson used that quote inside of the bus, and he shouldn't have said it, and it was wrong. That's an example. That's one example of what every single MP 
in every single party does or did do uh, or does over time they just that's just what it is yeah, they you, you, you twist yeah. things to you, to manipulate pub, uh, um, public opinion to yeah. get votes on your side well, which that's is exactly what, what project fear was about they told us to be mass job losses immediately the country being recession both sides play at it there is a fundamental problem with politics that people don't feel that they can trust members of parliament or people in the political system and i think a large part of the success of the brexit party and new new parties is that and even for the greens and the liberal democrats is that they feel that they can't trust the mainstream parties. In fact, the Liberal, Liberal Democrats got hammered. They started this by, they had a manifesto on tuition fees. And then when Nick Clegg joined the Conservative government and coalition, they went back on that. And that's what decimated them. <clears throat> so there is a, there's a fundamental breakdown of trust between the public and politics. How do you change that, though? How do you change that, all right? Because I, I thought this, one of the things, when I war game it for all of 10 seconds in my head, because that's about the depth of my knowledge when it comes to politics, I think, <laughs> how could you make, how could you change that? How could you make people, when they, how could you, how could you change it? So when a, an MP pledges something, because in the general election, for example, so when Boris Johnson, who's on about standing, isn't he? Oh, he is standing, says, if I get in, I will, for example, and he hasn't said this, but for example, Lower, um, uh, lower flipping and uh, national insurance contributions by five percent, whatever, right? And then he gets in, and he doesn't bother doing it. How do you make, how how do you get the people to make sure that what they are saying, well, if they, they don't actually try and do what they say they they said they do, or for, then they get pulled up for it, like uh, not like a, a, like a, 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 a not sanction. A flipping punishment. Yeah, no, no. Well, I, the, the election is going to be two years early now because you you haven't you haven't you haven't bothered your ass to achieve even fifty percent of the, manifesto, the pledges yeah. you made. You know, well, I mean, th that is a big point. Is how do you make people accountable to their manifestos? You can't just lock them up. Um, but that, no, and also, if he did, if he's if if those were in place, then the mission of the opposition would be don't let him or her get anywhere near fulfilling any of the, any of the manifesto because it, because yeah i mean that whole point of democracy and accountability is that yeah people want to be re-elected so if you deliver if you are not honest five years later you'll be thrown out that's the issue for me of the european union is that the new president that's been elected the commissioners <clears throat> there's no ability to get rid of them to hold them to account and they have executive and legislative powers that affect us the, the MEPs, and I'm interested to find out just how, what the accountability is, what the structure is. For as far as I'm concerned, or for as far as I can see, there's no uh, recall powers of the regional constituents. So I represent the southwest of England, huge area, Devon, Dorset, Wiltshire, Somerset, Do um, and Gibraltar, and uh, Cornwall. I mean, that's an enormous area, it's an enormous area to campaign in. Gibraltar? Yeah, Gibraltar's being bolted on into there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I had to go and campaign there, which is fascinating. I did the rock run, actually. <laughs> well, that's another story there. But um, uh, how can you really represent the interests of such a huge area where the, ec <clears throat> like the ec economic activities in those areas range from um, fishing towns and villages through to agriculture, a large number of farmers? You've got cities in there. Um, with industry, you've got um, you know tech companies, finance, so many interests. How can you how can you have enough knowledge or enough interaction with the public to pr adequately represent them? And then how can they hold you to account? An MP, your local MP, has to hold a surgery. He has a much smaller area and and is far more accountable. And as you can see in Peterborough, the by-election on Thursday, the local MP Fiona Onasanya, she was uh, guilty of. Um, speeding and lying oh yeah, 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 yeah and so her constituents all had a petition and they have called her back for a by-election so she's now resigned so she's been held accountable by her constituents that's how functioning parliamentary democracy should work and if by us returning all the powers to parliament we can make our own decisions in the future and hire and fire a government which we can still do at the moment but we have control over everything that's the point of a of a, an accountable democratic system, um, but I'm you know there is a lot to learn about the systems and committee structures within the European Parliament. 
and I will be writing about it. I've been asked to write in the Telegraph, writing in the Huffington Post. So I'm, I'm just going to give people a um, an account of what I see before me, the good, the bad, and the ugly um, over the over this journey. That'd be interesting. That'd be very interesting. Question for you: um, Why, why, are, why, why don't MEPs come from um, one of the MPs that serve in the southwest, for example? But you can't have you can't hold two positions. They are they're totally different jobs. You know, the MPs are incredibly busy at Westminster. Uh, to go out to be, be a member of the European Parliament, you it's a, it's, it's another job. There's there's a lot. There is a lot going on in brussels it has a lot of power um so yeah uh, that's not it's simply not not mm. possible all of you learning curve for me mate and um you know when when i was on last time i know we we can ask me as much as you want about politics um but we did talk about discussing afghanistan didn't we i know absolutely let's talk about the book you want to talk about the book yeah or the afghanistan go on well you brought it up you tell me what, what? we're going to talk about well, w- when you talk about books, I'm actually um, putting together uh, to write about wildlife crime, the wildlife wars and wildlife warriors, the people working to preserve the environment, to preserve nature. Um, a war is playing out globally, very much like the narcotic wars. Uh, and the only difference is that the commodity is wildlife. It's animals, it's hardwoods, it's ivory, it's rhino, rhino horn, all those things, when you tot it up, makes it the fourth largest uh, illegal uh, crime network in the world. And I think I talked about this. So I am um, pretty t- talking about writing a book about that because I think that's the issue of our times. We can come back to that one because that's easy. I could waffle on about that and I think I did last time. Afghanistan. Why do I want to write about Afghanistan? Well, we both went there. I've since seen some, some pretty alley photos of you back in... Uh, Sangin, that you were in Sangin, weren't Musa you? Kale. Musa Kala. I was in Sangin, but the well, photos that, you well, were. We can about. talk about this. It's interesting, Musa Kala, because I did Herrick Seven. We retook Musa Kala after it was given up. But um, what fascinates me about Afghanistan is, in the 1960s, it was on the hippie trail. People used to go out there and smoke drugs and chill out, go up, walk up the Hindu Kush. Beautiful place, rich in culture, very friendly people absolutely fascinating and stunning country which is what afghanistan should be then you had the soviets the war between 1970 was it 1981 and 1979 million people killed a million civilians killed soviets spent millions of pounds lost thousands even not hundreds of thousands of troops and ultimately lost they withdrew when the Ber- um yeah, when the Berlin Wall came down, the collapse of the Soviet Union. They lost that war. They lost that. 79 to 89, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was 70. You're right, 79 to 89. <clears throat> and it, it crushed an empire. Mm. And then the Taliban rose, and the Taliban allowed uh, Al Qaeda to uh, flourish in eastern Afghanistan. Uh, and more important than that, we got involved post 9 11. And we. I think we got involved there. It was a snap decision made by Tony Blair. But you remember, Tony Blair, 2001, was all powerful with a huge majority in government. He could basically do what he wanted, wanted, and he cozied up to George W. Bush. So we found Britain found itself in two foreign policy adventures, two foreign wars, because America went there, and we wanted to show that we were a good ally. So at that time, 2001, I don't know how old you were then, but I was just at the, the start of university when 20, 9-11 happened. 20. We were about the same age, aren't we? Yeah. So when I left uni, I did Royal Marine Commando training because I'd already signed up to the Royal Marines. They sponsored me through university. So I had no choice, although I had to pay back a load of money. But I wanted to be in the Marines. But what I signed up for before uni, the world completely changed in 2001. So we didn't have a choice. As soon as I did CTCRN, Commando Training Centre, became... A young officer went to 40 commando within two months i was in afghanistan <clears throat> 22 years old op parrot four and i was in kabul uh, patrolling around uh, looking after security of police district nine we had a few other police districts there we had riots we had ieds the whole host of asymmetric conflict going on 
Meanwhile, you guys were deployed down south into your patrol bases, into those isolated platoon houses. And I was at Camp Suter when John Reed, I can't remember what position he had, whether it's Foreign Secretary or Defence Secretary, or which, whatever he I think said. It was Foreign Secretary, I think it was. He said he hoped that you, he hoped that the Paras would deploy to Helmand without firing a shot. That shot being fired in anger, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, when the Paras deployed anywhere <laughs> without at least having a negligent <laughs> discharge? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. That's below the belt. Uh. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. How many times the, if you, if you think you're going into a place where you want a peace support operation, don't send in the Paras. <clears throat> I could think of other units to no, send in before you no, send that's, in. No, that's unfair. But you that's got. But let's that's be honest. Unfair. When you guys did, you're your... playing to the, you're you're talking to me like the paras are what their reputation is. The war fighters, mate. Yeah, but like we could Marines. do other things like peacekeep, like we have. Yeah, been. but that, you're. If you were like, imagine this. Right, if you're gonna, you're eat, you've got dinner laid out, and you're having a steak. <clears throat> you don't take a blunt knife to eat your steak do you you use a steak knife right. if you're going to war and you and you know it's going to be aggressive combat yeah what do you choose do you choose one of those regiments that no one's heard of or do you press the button and call in the marines and the paras yeah so for peacekeeping there's plenty of other regiments wasn't the peacekeeping operation. well it was so you you guys prepared for war didn't you no, did we? Did we hack? No, our beat up. Tra- no, 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 no. See, this is what people what don't realise. What was your op tag like? Were you, were our you prepared tag, for it? Our op tag was based on base. So you know how Iraq, the Iraq op tag, yeah, was more or less Northern Ireland, but the people who were playing enemy had different kind of skin. Yeah, yeah, it was more or less very, very similar. Quite calm. Hmm? It was calm. calm. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. It was all about. Acts. It was just no, no, none of that. Um. It was the the beat of training was not not what it should have been. Then, granted, we went to we went for three weeks to Oman, and then we did conventional, the convention, conventional stuff there, mm. um, in Oman, and then we went to uh, Afghan. But you know, the first few weeks we deployed there, nothing was going on. We were out patrolling. No, you didn't go looking for fights. Were you handing <laughs> out was, blankets? No, 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 no. But we were in uh, Musakala. What about? Hang Musikala? on. So you landed in Musakala? No, no, no. The beginning of the tour, the first place I went, it was Goreshk. Yeah, that's a badass place. At the time, it was alright. Yeah, Goreshk was alright. That first few weeks, yeah. there, it was fine. Out patrolling about, getting people to the ground, killing, killing, engagements, the usual stuff that mm. you do elsewhere. And then it went. It started going peep top. We went into. Um, I think the first, the first contact that happened, we went into. It was an, a company operation at Nauzad. And it was because the the Afghan police, the AMP, in their outpost. Now I, I might be butchering this recollection. I'm trying to think of the reason that we went in there. Mm. And basically, we went into a sweet um, push out the Taliban from from the town who were harassing the police. As what, I what as was I your recall. what was the mission that your unit got deployed, and what were you told you were there to achieve? Again, I'm trying to remember this from 17 years ago, 17 years ago, 13 years ago. Secure Helmand Province or key parts of Helmand Province so that imp- and, and I am absolutely like this is not even paraphrasing basically improvements can be made from um, pr- uh, PRTs provincial reconstruction teams going in and correct in inverted commas the bad doings and practices that the Taliban were putting in place like uh, c- c- girl, girls couldn't go to school w- women were oppressed Blah 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 blah. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that we were there it was right or wrong either. Good. No, no, I know. Uh, but mm. this is part of when we talk about. You said I'm going to write a book or I'm going to do a documentary on Afghanistan. The answer is yes because I believe that when if you look at it in hindsight, <coughs> you know we we entered into a conflict which is not the original based on the original reason we were there, and then. The mission creeps outrageous without the political support support back in the UK, and since we've withdrawn, okay, albeit there's 550 British troops there and there is some activity, but since that we officially withdrew, it's been swept under the carpet. You never hear about it in the news. No politicians discuss it. 
they they discount the fact that over 150,000 civilians were killed that the the conflict the combined total of american british expenditure is over a trillion pounds or trillion dollars the amount of troops that we lost and then there's been no real accountability from the military or through the chain of command up to the political level of the decisions are made the tactics the operational um, strategy and the grand strategy we've just fought the longest war in british and american history and it's as if nothing had happened and so piecing this together your story other people's stories you know what are, what were we all doing individually why were the why did we think we were there and you went back i take it after for it for twice oh yeah like me then went to which other tours did you do herrick eight herrick 13 oh i did eight. Oh shit you're an eight as well bloody hell and 13 what year was that 2010-2011 christmas tour winter okay. tour okay i did uh 11 12 yeah okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. so yeah very so we've had a very similar snapshot of the conflict yeah throughout most of the start to finish because almost. my second tour is a heavy there's the heaviest one with viking armor support group oh, did, i did eight month tour and it was just complete carnage i mean say no rules engagement card alphas that was all out the window you know we're going out on the ground firing three or four i laws 66s every contact the one contact we fired 55,000 rounds of 7.62 with a troop. But the troop of Vikings, is that's 14 guys. 55,000 rounds. That's mental. What are yeah. they firing at? Fuck all. I'm joking. <laughs> we got ambushed, anti-armor ambush. Um, chasing shadows. We got an anti-armor ambush down from Nusa Kala back down to Sangan. As, oh, you know what? You were on this job. What, her eight? Do you remember the air assault we did out the Sangan Valley? The Musica- you know the you know the route from Sangin up to Musicala. Mm-hmm. Were you in three para? Yeah. So did you not do the land on the air assault? Do I have to remind me of this? Well, we we we. Is this? Got... Well, not Herrick Eight. Yeah, I know Herrick Eight. The first thing is the problem with Herrick Eight for for me is it was uh, I wasn't there for the first stop, the first mission, which was about, about a week or so, and I wasn't ever there for the, the a couple of the last ones, but. The problem with with me recollecting Herrick 8 is that we were doing strike ops at the Kandahar. So there was loads and loads and loads of small, short stuff. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, no, no. Oh, for, for every, sometimes three weeks at a time. But it was out, in, out, in, out, out. So it was loads of different, loads of different missions at loads of different areas. Yeah, well, this this was, this was one, the whole battalion. Or at least two or three companies. That must have been the, either the very start when they opted to get Yoda or towards the end when they were the doing the turbine. Yoda. Yeah. Yoda was one of the targets, but anyway, oh, so, that's the first one. That was, that was just before I went out there. But what happened was, um, Paris landed, bombed around for two days because obviously the Taliban saw a load of Paris coming. We're like, we don't fancy this. We were the we were support. We had a lot of ammunition support and fire support with Viking vehicles. But when the uh, the CO got bored, lifted off all the Paris, and that left two troops of Viking on the ground in the middle of Badland Helmand and. We they just they saw that the river was high because of the meltwater coming off the mountains. It means that you only could fjord the river in a few places, even though the Vikings float and swim. It, the river is fast flowing, so we did we have very limited options. So they worked out which routes we'd have to go back, and they laid they dug in over two days and they they laid a ten kilometer anti armor ambush, and we had three oh M kills on vehicles. But one one power shot through the leg and ass. Um, I lost. I lost one guy. I lo- another lost his legs. Another one burnt badly. We took about six casualties, and we f- we were out of ammunition by the time we got back to Sangin. No air support, no JTAP, so we're having to go hot on the net um, in clear. Okay. Oh, why is that? Why didn't? But they didn't let us keep the JTAP. The CO just took took everything off. I said, no, yeah, they'll be fine. Um, I ended up calling fire. I ended up calling artillery onto a small village because we were getting hammered from it horrendous really if you think about it laying down mm. you know 105s fire for effect continuously smoke everything um but we were we had run out of ammunition and we we're completely surrounded i think the stats in the end i think we we lost one we six seven casualties three m kills that's that's millions of pounds worth of vehicles taken out we killed 20 of them um complete carnage and that was swept under the carpet but you know what was that battle about Part part of the problem with these with these campaigns is <clears throat> and obviously plays into politics as well. Is that you know regardless of whether the reason we when we we start one is right or or wrong, 
it's that over the life of them, if you can do them for a significant period of time, like Afghan was, what? I mean, it's insignificant in what you're trying to achieve, mind. Um, but look how many, look how many, how many leaders change hands in that time. Mm. You know, from Westminster to uh, uh, Minis- defense the minister. White House yeah, to yeah. you know exactly defense minister to flipping senior senior generals in that in the army and 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 and, and the navy and the air force and how so how would you keep a like you're saying that mission creep uh, uh, you, how would you change that um i don't think you it can. did change and you know what also changed was we became defensive we became scared of casualties we lost the night we just created more casualties we created opinion. more so yeah. we had these bigger vehicles heavier body armor couldn't move De- everyone getting dehydrated we were fit like fixed they had complete freedom of the night, freedom of a manoeuvre. All the things that we um, practice and we preach in our doctrine, we completely ignored. I, mean, I did actually uh, an operation which I got in trouble for um, with the powers, actually. And I had, I had, I had set teed up with the, with the Marines, a 40 commando, and I said, you know, if we want to own the night, we need to impose a, cur- impose a curfew or at least dominate it by <coughs> patrolling but by scaring those that are digging in IEDs, that they think every time someone gets caught digging, out of nowhere comes a bullet. You just drop those people. So you that's the way you dominate the ground. You create that fear that if they go out at night and they're laying IEDs close to our bases, they're going to get dropped. So you leave small stay, but stay behind patrols of four, maximum six people. Because what year is you know, this? Sorry, this, what, is, what this is 2007. Okay. <clears throat> I said, you know... We've got to take the risk. Four guys can defend themselves for long enough to a QRF to get there. But the policy was, the battle group Newport North policy was, minimum of a platoon or, or a troop out at any one time. Minimum numbers, they say 25 to 32. But that, you, know, you cannot hide 32 blokes in the green zone or in the desert. But what you can do is go out as a patrol of 30 and drop off two small pockets of four people because they're not unlikely to count you in. And then they go at last light. And then when those guys come out to dig in their IEDs, you just start dropping them. Or at least go over and interdict them. And when they know that they can't, they don't have freedom of manoeuvre at night, then we would have pushed back the IED belt and we'd have had more manoeuvrability to patrol. But we didn't do that. So I did end up running an operation uh, later on, which I didn't fully ask permission to do, but I thought it would be an experiment. Which is to put a lay behind in. I got, I got some lay behind from Fob Robinson. I went out with the vehicles. I got four willing paras, snipers. Um, and I pretended that, that one of our Vikings had, had hit an IED. So we put loads of smoke, chucked a load of grenades, made it look like it had blown up. And then we towed it away, burnt out a load of tires, left a load of crap in the desert, burning away. And I knew that the Taliban would come out to see what had happened. And we had in this offset position para snipers. And I pulled out, and as I pulled out, lo and behold, up came the guys on the motorbikes with the I- ICOM. We had the chatter, we confirmed that they were um, Taliban commanders, but we couldn't PID any weapons. And when I put the fire mission in or the permission into uh, the battle group, it was denied. You can't, you don't have the rules of engagement to engage those people those all that we knew to be taliban and so you're fight you know you it's like going to boxing ring with one hand tied behind your back so that you know these stories we talk about they're just small vignettes of the desperate operation of good good soldiers good good marines on the ground yet we didn't have the the right rules of engagement the right political will um even the intelligence or the cultural understanding of afghanistan no one really had that and so you think we had this longest conflict and no one's even talking about it. It, you know, it's forgotten. And I think we owe it to the people that gave their lives. We owe it to the people of Afghanistan. We owe it to the country, the taxpayers, and to everybody to talk about it and really dissect what's happened. Which is why, um, you know, I want to write a book, Poppy Fields, and I've been <coughs> documenting things about Britain's and America's longest war. How? How? What's the progress of it? Well, nothing in the last six weeks. <laughs> this election's <laughs> taken over. I can tell you that. Um, what's the progress? Well, have we started it? Um, I've been, I've been document- researching. Yeah, I've been putting, yeah. I've been doing the research on it because uh, quite a lot of military b- books focus uh, ex you know, army, marines, 
all these special forces guys they like to talk about their own battle experiences and yeah i've got been in tons of battles but i think um having studied history i'm interested in a bit bit more of the why and the what happened almost like a dual narrative <clears throat> what we've been talking about is those intimate experiences on the ground which people like to hear about that but at the same time at every point that we were on the ground there'll be some dialogue going on in the white house or westminster or some new commander and some reason that we're getting dicked about on the ground because somebody new's come in or they're going to that you know some new law has been passed or the lawyers have got worried about some sort of ca civilian casualty and they want to restrict our freedom of maneuver even more and that what happens at the policy level was obviously directly influencing the way we operated on the ground and i don't think that those two narratives have ever been sewn together from a soldier's view and from a sort of historical political view mm, no it'd be it'd be good to it'd be good to read mate when it's done and it's i mean there, there are a sort of things i don't think i don't think you can i, I think if you if you lowered the ROE to no, if you changed the ROE to suit what you and I would are quite happy and and know what is required to, so basically if we to give it more more onus on the person who's going to be taking a shot or making a decision uh, to to act in in an ethical and moral responsible means way. a responsible way, then that that's fine. But then you get morons. I don't think you can change that. But I mean. <clears throat> A hundred percent, people will get out of control. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, I, um, but the from from that perspective that you're talking about, there's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem with the information about these campaigns in that he, he, people either one way or the other, and it's either it was, why we're there. It's completely bollocks. We achieved nothing, which isn't right. Um, because at one point we were there for a reason, and we were achieving things, at, and at least one point, right. Yeah, I mean, one big notable point about Afghanistan is not all doom and gloom. Whilst we were on the ground, there were no terrorist attacks in the United Kingdom. They all came out to fight us. And better they fight us out there than they take on civilians in the UK. See, that would be swung. So it, we, you asked me before the podcast who I had on recently. I had on a guy called Philip Clark, who is the UK coordinator for Veterans for Peace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should have got these flipping wine gums. Yeah, <laughs> choking on your own. I keep getting stuck in my throat. Um, the and seat is unbelievably uncomfortable, by the way. Never yeah, mind. These are new ones, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, what? How? What were you talking about then? Oh yeah, veterans of peace. Yeah. Oh, and so what are you saying? Oh right, there, there were no no terrorist attacks happened while we were in Afghanistan. They happened after. Right. So the way he would, and I'm think he did come on to something like that as well. The terrorist attacks happened because we were in Afghanistan. You don't know either way, right? You don't know either way. But well, nine eleven, we weren't in Afghanistan. Exactly. I'm. I'm yeah, one, it's I one of the things I brought up. It was. It's, it'd be worth you listening to it, mate. An interesting, interesting conversation. Um, but the point, the point being is, you need to have people like yourself, not myself. I don't have your knowledge, education, or. Um, bigger picture oversight when you were serving and, and now to be able to put it or oh, I'm not I can't stream any words together either many words this is a nightmare today isn't it? this is an absolute nightmare. sorry I've got a wire trap on my leg yeah what is going on yeah you got it right, right. Um, so it'd be interesting to, to for you to put it into words because you are quite happy to talk about battles and contacts as they were on the ground and, and in, you know as a soldier would but you're also quite happy uh, to acknowledge or or address and discuss areas that are up for debate like why are we there was it worth it what was the point um the motivations of going there uh like you said blair and and wanting to uh, side up with the americans as as allies but then what one of the things with, with that point of view is uh, is that a, is that a bad thing to want to side with a stronger power or show your allegiance to a, a stronger power is it a bad thing in terms of longevity for the survival of the nation interestingly i was listening to tony blair talk about why we should stay in the european union and his thesis is 50 percent correct um that as the two main powers in the world or power is based upon economic might or number of people you have so china and india are going to be the dominant players in the future 
we will only survive and have any influence if we all club together uh, and create this nation, this European nation. That's Blair's view. And he's right to say that you know, China is going to become the most powerful country in the world. India's right up there. And then below that are economies and countries that have over between 150 to 250 million people. So big, big countries, they're going to have increasing influence. Um, but he's wrong to say the only way to counter that is then we've all got to create a United States of Europe, which is what he's an advocate for. He's a federalist. Because... Um, we can have alliances against uh, these organizations. We can have strong alliances. And that's what NATO has proved. NATO faced down the uh, Soviet Union. NATO has worked, uh, which the, it's the longest standing, most successful military alliance in history. Today or this week, we celebrate D Day. That was a coalition of countries from all around the world, all around from at the time, the British Empire, America. Canada, we all work together in a coalition under a single command for a common purpose. We can continue to do that on, on the issues of the day, such as environmental issues. We can, we have organizations or we can form new organizations where we collectively agree. So you don't need to become one country. They talk about Alliance of America. Um, so we do need long alliances with strong partners. But that does not mean America should decide our foreign policy and we should have the strength of, and courage as France has done twice to say we don't agree with that conflict and we will support you in other ways but we are not going to get involved in your war and the French did that in Vietnam the French did that in 2003 uh, in Iraq they didn't get involved and you know what they're still they've still got very strong ties uh, with the United States and they've proved themselves uh, as being a capable military partner in the 21st century with some of their operations in Mali. So we don't have to have our foreign policy run by America and we also don't need to have our domestic policy and all our other laws made uh, in the European Union. We can be independent and be a, a, a powerful, strong, uh, hard power and soft power in the world. But, and, but that's by having um, a voice in organizations global organ international organizations that doesn't mean you need to give away your sovereignty to other people that's been my fundamental view on brexit but that's also my view on foreign policy where i do think uh, since 1997 we have done everything that the americans have wanted us to do since 97 yeah when blair came in that's when the whole thing went peaked on mm. In the United Kingdom, in my view. That's also when we signed up most of these treaties for the European Union. 1991 was Maastricht, and then there was three more after that. Amsterdam, Nice, and Lisbon. They created the European Union as of today. And Blair never asked the British population, do you want this or not? So we are now, we live in the post-Iraq-Afghanistan era, era. We live in the post-2008 world economic crash era, where bankers were allowed to get away with murder under Blair mm -hmm. and uh, what's it called? Bush. Yeah. And we live in an era where the European Union has grown unchecked. These treaties have allowed an organization to grow that is unaccountable, not, had lacks transparency and people feel detached. They feel they're, they're angry at our foreign policy. They're angry at the banking system. They're angry at politicians all round because they feel they can't be trusted. They've not delivered um, equality in living standards. And, you know, they've been starting conflicts, which has had a blowback effect. We have had, there has been terrorist incidents in the United Kingdom because of things that we have done overseas. And you, you know, you and I know that we're not particularly popular in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And some of our actions have radicalized people there. So, that's why I say 1997 was a watershed because the actions of the Blair government, um, yeah, I'm bloody uncomfortable here. <laughs> the actions of the Blair government, we're now sorting out in 2019. Mm. Going back to NATO and um, and you you referenced D Day and people coming together and showing that you can you can get together and you know fight the good fight when it's needed. Is that not th those are reactive though? right 
Those are re- those are reactive things, reacting to threats. Well, yeah, but yeah, we've, we've got NATO now, haven't we? So we we don't we don't need a European defence union to creating a common defence policy and army and navy. No, I don't agree with that. No. no. Um, but that's what they're creating at the moment. The European defence union. We've got NATO. Um, the e- so the European defence union is actually a thing that's actually going to happen. Yeah. Describe it to me. What's what outline it? So what they're trying to do is um, what they are doing is you are creating command structures which enables them to take in national armies, so uh, elements of <coughs> British Armed Forces and all the other 27 uh, nation states and put them under a European command. So the command structure will have different uh, um, senior personnel from across the European Union and they command the forces put into their, uh, under their structure which uh, is essentially rivaling NATO. That's what NATO does, but it's a European Union structure, which it creates a, a, by default a European army, a European navy, and a European air force, because it's, that structure is independent uh, of the nation-state command structure. Oh. It's not been debated. So, and it's way more complex than any of us think, and I, and I will be the first to say I do not know the details of what has happened in the last year i've only just started really looking into looking into it properly and i'm looking forward to going to the european union to actually see just is it scare tactics that 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 um we are now fully fully getting involved in the european defense union and they are really on the road to creating a european army um or um is it actually just a still an idea and it doesn't lack it actually still lacks teeth we need to find out more but from everything i'm hearing from those that do know that uh, the the truth is that we have signed us in ourselves into something that is a replication of nato and if you listen to the rhetoric from president uh, macron uh, and other leaders across the european union they absolutely intend to rival nato to create a single federalized european armed forces and no, that's not been put to the, that's not been, the European people haven't been asked about that in different nations. We haven't been asked about that. We need to find out more, mate. Um, but ultimately, we should be leaving, so we shouldn't be too worried about all that. Mm. If we leave on the, thir- <clears throat> if we leave on the 31st of October, you'll still have a period to serve after that, won't you? No, out. It, it won't be like a, a back on soap the street, period. Mate. Back on the street. Yeah, I would have thought you'd have to stay under the, the bridge. Better. Under the bridge, because it'd be like a transition, wouldn't it? Like a no, no, I don't. I don't know. I know. I've, I've got. Like I say, you know, I'm. I really do want to um, dedicate time for these two books I want to write about wildlife wars and Afghanistan. Um, because you know, looking at this, the schedule over the summer now, I'm gonna be pretty busy. So I'm looking forward to getting back to the issues I really care about: environment, and I still think there is unfinished business to be resolved about talking about afghanistan mm, definitely yeah no i agree i the uh the, the cl- climate change at the minute it seems to of the last to me it seems over the last few months it just seems to have taken a, a a leap forward in terms of the the efforts people organizations countries are going to, yeah, to yeah. bring it down it's all of a sudden like people i think people are realizing i'm not sure i'm not sure i mean there was a thing that came out uh a couple of months back was it Say now England, in within twenty five within twenty five years or in fifteen years, twenty five years will be in negative supply of pot- potable water. England. No, we, not, we discussed this water wars last time, didn't we? Yeah, but we didn't discuss England and that that. But uh, I, I thought flipping heck, that brings it properly close to home. Like if it is fifteen yeah, years, yeah. that is, and people, you know, and that that sort of headline that should. That should still be a headline today. That should be a headline every day until we fix that problem because yeah, yeah. the repercussions well, we are can't enormous. Fix, yeah. you know. But mate, it doesn't rain anymore. You can, you can reliably invite people around for a barbecue. It does not rain like mate, it I'm used to. I'm on a bike to. today. And it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, today. <laughs> okay, <laughs> raining today. But in comparison, the winter and summer, compared to when we were a child, everything was just rained off. I might, I would be in, or maybe I need to look at the statistics of this. Maybe I'm making up. But I think it you should. Feels 
like I will as well. we're getting hotter summers. You know, yeah. but I, I remember as a little kid on fireworks night <laughs> being freezing because there was snow up my little wellies. Hey, when's the last time it snowed in November in the United Kingdom? You need to have a look at the uh, actual data. But the, the yeah. data must be right because they wouldn't be saying it otherwise. I it, do, it mate, I, up, I do know the data says that go, things, right. the temperature. I right, do know, yeah. I, but I don't want to say I can't give you precise, precise details. But there's the, the, the trajectory uh, is the ch- climate change. Okay, for another example, we now have I'm some, not disagreeing, yeah. some of the best vineyards in the world. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. French champagne. Um, what do you call them? Vineyards, isn't it? Vineyards, that's the one. They're buying plots of land in Kent because our earth and our conditions are perfect for champagne. Well, that wasn't happening in the 90s and the 80s. So, you know, things are changing. But, you know, as we've discussed the climate change thing last time, you know, it is real. I, I, I agree with you that something has changed. And I think what, what are those distinctive markers that have changed people's minds the blue planet 2 effect um on the plastics that's that certainly launched a, a public awareness campaign then this um this extinction rebellion movement this year has certainly forced the issue people to acknowledge it the, what, the what? do you know the people that took up residence in parliament square and glued themselves to buses and brought yeah. london to a, to a, not a standstill but it really affected people and it got a lot of press attention Followed by, um, there's been some re- reports released about the loss of biodiversity, and there could be a million species going extinct because of uh, anthropogenic or human activities. Uh, and then we've had youth movements across the world. You probably heard of this Greta Thunberg, the student, um, and many other amazing young young people are taking this issue incredibly incredibly seriously because they're worried they're not going to enjoy wildlife in the same way as we have done. So I think. There's been a combination of factors, but I still worry that that is only in mature liberal democracies like UK. I'm not sure that message is as obvious or publicly um, well received in the United States and certainly not China or the Far East or the emerging economies, developing countries in Africa. They don't have really time, even though if climate change really affects them, they're not necessarily thinking about good practice for the environment or nature because uh, these some of these countries are developing so in our own micro political climates in the uk i think we think the world's going to be getting better quickly that's not actually the case mm. no yeah i i, I agree how are we doing for it. time well, i'm boring you am i no i just wondering I'm, i'll check the time <laughs> all have right you, have, you got to get, have you got <laughs> have you got to get off um, got five ten minutes, mate. Five okay, ten. Yeah. Minutes. Five. We've got ten minutes max. Okay, well, let's ten. do five. Let's do see some, do some quick fire questions. You are bored, aren't you? You are bored. It's great. No, no, it's not. <laughs> I'm bored of my own voice. No, no, don't worry about it. Well, I tell you what, mate. You'll be coming on a third time, will you? <laughs> <laughs> I will do. No, I, I enjoy it, but um, I tell you, I suddenly realised I've heard a lot of my own voice in like, these ear, ear, earphone things for the last six weeks. I've been doing loads of interviews. What's wrong with that? You've got a good voice, mate. No, I don't know. No, you, I, li- I, I like it a lot. Do you I like it a lot. <laughs> yeah, from the let's para. talk about this. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a face for radio. Let's talk about... Um, let's talk about, with all the para slaggings, mm. let's talk about the Royal Marines Commando doll that is on sale. That is Tom Hardy's head. Want to talk about that? Why would and that's been retailed by Royal uh, Royal Marines, yeah, veteran no. owned. Yeah, yeah, owned. yeah. Why would that happen, Jim? Would, Why on earth would is you? It, do... Is it a doll? It's a flipping doll, mate. What? Why? What? Yeah, it's a doll. It's a picture of it. Yeah, doll. Yeah, I see. I have. Seen when it. I say doll, I mean it's, comes... a, it's a it's an action man, action man. I didn't mean I mean action man. Yeah. I obviously yeah. I love the Royal Marines, but I I do and find Tom it, Hardy. I do find it extraordinary how we um, latch on to celebrities, and. And, you know, we want to be so matey with them. Um, he wasn't even a bootnet. He hasn't got his green beret. There's nothing wrong, There's nothing wrong with that, right? It's good for you. No, I understand we did it for but, PR. But, but, um, but, he's not a bootnet, is he? Mate, you would not find Power Edge putting anyone who hasn't earned that room beret. And, 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 you're, and you're, 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 you're quite right to do, yeah. 
No, that, that is Chad. I, I, I mean, that is complete nonsense. Could make all of your ambassadors uh, action ring, couldn't you? I'd buy the Jimmy Savile one. He was a big ambassador, isn't he? I mean, can you believe? <laughs> of all, all, when this is it, of, of all the mistakes to have your of as your ambassador, the Royal Marines ha- gave Jimmy Savile uh, honorary wasn't there Green a, Beret. And wasn't you, there a building named after him on the camp? When I joined the Marines, there was a Jimmy Savile room. <laughs> How sinister is that? Down, down... Down at the commando training center, there was Jimmy Sow, and you think, and you think, bloody hell, what? It's all, I mean, but are, this, are we doing enough due diligence on these um, so called ambassadors thing? Uh, on, on their views and the variety? And it sounds great, matey, matey of Tom Hardy, and I'm sure Tom Hardy's a really good guy. Here he is. Um, and he's obviously he's an amazing actor. Oh, yeah, this isn't a slight against I'm Tom not Hardy. Saying he is. No, no, it's not no, against no, him, no, no. but um, you are, he's if gorgeous. they are your ambassador, you know, things can go wrong. Uh, I, do you know what? I think they should all have to do the commando course to be an ambassador. But why? You know, I don't know. You'd have no ambassadors, mate. It'd be very few. Yeah, like, fair enough. Well, all I say is I agree with you. Why are we making dolls? <laughs> I want to buy it. With <laughs> Why don't you have one? You should have one, Stitter. <laughs> it's going yeah. to be in the studio. Mate, the thing is, you laugh now at us, <laughs> but I guarantee that someone's going to have the business idea. Some pal's like, oh, the Marine's doing that, making money. Let's no, make a it'll power be a, one. it'll be a boot neck doing it. Oh, boot neck. Like, uh, uh, mo- uh, pretending to be a para and uh, doing pretending some... But who would it be? What ambassadors have we got? <laughs> yeah. Who have we got? I, di- I did like... Oh, uh, ah, I tell you who we have got. Sorry to interrupt. So we have got. Um, who have you got? Ross just did the D-Day jumps. Oh, God, that was awful. What? That bloke uh, d- the other day, last night, or the other night. Brilliant! It was rubbish. What are you talking about? What was bad about it? Who is that bloke? I'm a motorbiker. What's he His called? name eludes me. Just, uh, nobody. Oh, rubbish on he's TV. Not a nobody. He's not a nobody. He's, he's, mate, he's down to earth. He's a dude. What the fuck's his name? <laughs> he, that cele- that that's celeb shit, status. When you you program. don't even need to remember the name because of that celeb. Uh, oh, oh, God. I was just I, talking about him today. I recognise the name, but it was crap. No, it wasn't crap. It was really Mate, good. I thought, really I, good. I thought Powers Ma- Men of War was one of the best documentaries about the armed forces in 10, 15 years. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And like, it's a shame it was only three parts. It hasn't gone along longer. Because, uh, yeah, you know, we've had quite... The Royal Marines are good at doing these things, but I think, you're, you know, that was... No, really, that one you did was a fucking embarrassment. Yeah, it was, yeah. The yeah. last one was an yeah, embarrassment. Was, yeah. We were, luck, we, were luck, we were lucky. Yeah. I, I, I had the or good the, fortune the, to meet the, the, producer, leader, yeah. one of the producers. I, I'm, I'm more old school in these things. I'm not interested in showing the sort of, you know, the softer sides. Well, get on with it. Show what we do. Show the operations. You know, this is it's tough. Let's not dress up combat. Let's tell it as it is. Um, but there, of course, we've got a human side. Um, but I'm more old school in that. And, but I think the, the that gave a good account of the powers. And I'm sure, and I hope you've had a good surge of recruitment from that. I think so, yeah. I think I think, it's, I think, I think that's, that's what happened. Yeah, I had the good fortune to talk to um, one of the producers involved in that after it was done. Did he? Yeah, a lady. And got all the, the um, behind the scenes, what else went on that they couldn't, that they couldn't put on TV. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's quite good. It's quite good. Um, oh, I, could ima- I could imagine there was some career-ending stuff that they managed to keep off the... Th- uh, off the cut yeah yeah you know it was the powers, isn't it? but at the same time it, it was um it was nice to hear how little had been staged yeah you know um they gave them really for then yeah it was, it was interesting really good mate six minutes to seven what's that guy's name the motorbiker <sighs> ranks tt Iron Man tt close up to the edge um why is he picked what's his what's his status with the powers and it's not. No, it's not. No. It's not. He, he's just a petrol head, isn't he? And he's a, he's a petrol head. He's he's quite prominent on that kind of TV mm. now to do with big engines and things with motors and planes and boats and ah oh, man, what's his name? Anyway, uh, so he. You know, my dad did the twentieth uh, anniversary jump at Arnhem. Twenty fifth. Yeah. Jesus. Here's here's in ten power. Because ten power did the jump to Arnhem. Oh yeah. yeah and he yeah. said uh, a couple of the guys had fought at Arnhem. Were in Tampa at the time. Showed did the battlefield tour. Awesome. I mean, that is. Are we so? That's fifty years ago. How was my dad? Seventy. Bloody hours. Yeah. Oh, crazy. We going out. To, I'm, um, I'm doing a talk. On, I'm not. Talk, I'm talking on BBC on Thursday about D Day actually. Um. 
and I, you know, could, I can't imagine what it's like doing an opposed beach landing. It's bad mm. enough jumping in the water when it's freezing at night mm. and running up the beach of your kit without being shot at and running through barbed wire. So, yeah, that's going to be interesting to talk to other people, potentially some veterans and uh, historians on Thursday. You got a so, motorbike license? I have, yeah. I had a Triumph Tiger, but I've given up on the motorbiking. I think that's the most dangerous activity that you can do as a human being. It depends how you ride it. Hey, it's a, it depends how other people would ride it and what the state the motorway is in. Mm. Anyway, we're, we're bike, rambling now. How long well, have we got? Well, because the reason I asked, we're biking out to Arnhem for the Arnhem. Oh, are you? Oh, I see. Speak off air. Okay. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to jump in there, but I don't think it'll go down well, boot yeah, jumping did, yeah. in. Yeah, I did it, yeah. No, you can still jump. Oh, what? No, that trip to Arnhem, there's a bunch of bootnecks coming. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Interested. Well, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Some of you know. All right, right. mate. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, mate. Uh, yeah. As always. Uh, the, the last time you ever on? <laughs> no, I good, look forward uh, to round three. <laughs> Let, let's do a round three next good year. Good luck, uh, mate. Good luck with the MEP Thank you stuff. Very much. Good yeah. luck with the books and, most importantly, the conservation efforts. Yes. Honestly. And I have a TV show coming out I'm on sorry, yeah, yeah. Shark Week, 28th of. July this year, Shark Week, Discovery Channel, America's favourite week, soon to be Britain's favourite week, and the show is called Shark Wreck 2 with Paul de Gelder and I. And uh, yeah, I'm really. Like we spoke about last it. time. Yeah, absolutely. You jumped so, into the water again. Yeah, we, we skydive into the Pacific and um, we're retelling some of the stories of what it's like to be a Second World War pilot shot down in the Pacific. So we jump in, spend two days in the water and with sharks, a shark sanctuary. And of course, we're um, raising conservation issues and just how many sharks have been killed as a result of commercial fishing. So yeah, it's an adventure conservation program. So please tune in to Shark Week this year. 100%. Awesome. James Glancy. All right, mate. Dot UK, James, right? James Glancy dot com. Dot com. Mate, done. Excellent. Great. Should we fist pump? Because it's <laughs> the second time fist pump, mate. <laughs>